a good name. Do you have a good name? Work for 81 years? How many, I'm just curious, how many of you like your names? Raise your hands. Oh, okay, <clears throat> about half of you. How many of you do not like your names? Just, just, some of you are not voting. You don't know. Is it because that's your, you're under a different name? It's your secret name. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't really care for mine. I'm just going to be honest. My mother named me after some uh, good-looking movie, movie star of the 70s. Thought it was going to work out for me. I said, who is Chad Everett? And some of you people who apparently watched television in the early 70s might know who that is. My, my mom said, well, he's kind of like the George Clooney of the 70s. Some of you younger people are like, well, who's George Clooney? So... Anyway, you know, a few elections ago, I would get people coming up to me and saying, how's it hanging, Chad? <laughs> Some of you get that joke. I didn't think it was that funny. But typically, on any type of media, if the guy's name's Chad, he's pretty much a, a loser. <laughs> so I'm like... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, but my middle name's not that much. Uh, this is no offense to any people that are named Chad in the audience. I'm sure you're cool. Um, my middle name's Eugene, so my last name is Bernard. So which one would you go with? Right? I used to be called Saint all the time. I thought it was for my pious living, and I made the connection. The big, fat, hairy, slobby dog. So <laughs> names are tough. <laughs> names are really, really tough. And um, I want to talk to you about name changers. That's uh, the concept. But before I do, I want to I pray with you again. Lord, thank you for family. You've called church. Lord, you set this church up to defeat hell. Amen. You said they don't have a chance against my church. And so, Lord, I pray for Papa. His family would be a force in this area. We would love one another. We would meet those outside of these walls and tell them about you and how amazing you are. Lord, speak through me. I pray that the stories and the scripture and that I share this morning is what you would want me to do is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So <clears throat> I want to I'll give you a little, I don't know, if Michael, if you would agree with me. Where did he go? Where's he? Somewhere around here. Uh, Pastor Taylor. A lot of times uh, pastors will give sermons. They're just simply, simply this. God has already rebuked me earlier in the week, and so I'm giving it to you now. Maybe rebuke's the wrong word. But a lot of times it's like, this is how it is. I'm like, oh man, I get it. Um, I, just to give you a little bit of background, I, I serve as the youth director for the Michigan Conference. I absolutely love my job. It's a, it's a great job. I get to um, work with young people, travel all over the state, and it's a, it's a rich blessing. I am a product of Seventh-day Adventist schools. Uh, amen, some of you say amen or have mercy, depending on how uh, you know me. From first grade to however number I went, um, I did graduate, uh, I, I, I went to Adventist schools. And what's intriguing about me is um, I have been consistently told my whole life to stop talking. Stop talking, stop talking. You talk too much. Um, which is kind of ironic that my job is talk too much. <laughs> um, but anyway, as I was reading scripture, I saw some things that were really kind of interesting. Jesus or, or God often would change people's names. And he would do this uh, in, in very, via very unique fashions. So if you have your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 17. 
I just want to show you a couple of examples, and we're going to talk about names. Genesis chapter 17. If you're there, say amen. If you need some more time, say have mercy. All right. Genesis 17, and we're going to look at verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. If you go down to verse 15... He says, and God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, this is kind of intriguing. Um, He really doesn't change their name. It's like saying, your name is Bill, but now it's Billy. Your name is Jen, but it's now Jenny. And you, you know, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck here, but you're like, well, that's a big name there, change. Uh, But what I'm realizing in Scripture, here's what God does, which I think is really intriguing. He says, you would be a whole lot better doing what you do if you did it for me. Just think about that for a second. I'm going to ask you this question. Just, Just pause for a second. 30 seconds, not even, you you don't need 30 seconds, 15 seconds. I want you to think of what, when people say your name, what do they think of? 15 seconds, just think about it. Troy Reichert, what do they think of? Okay, go ahead, think that through. You got it? You need to think about it? Now, here's what I want you to do. If you're sitting next to someone you know, If it's a stranger, that would be a little more difficult. But if you're sitting next to someone you know, I want you to look at that person right now. Stare into their eyes. (laughs) I want you to think about what you think of when you think of that person. Now, I'd like you to share with each other what you both came up with and see if it matches. Go. Okay, now, I'm assuming because it's church, you are kind to one another. (laughs) Amen? Amen? You save that for the ride home, Sam? (laughs) This is what I really want to tell you, Mark. (laughs) No, but I would imagine if I wanted to embarrass someone like Mark, and I told him to stand up, and, you, and we said, okay, what, a, what do you think of when you think of this man or when you see this man, that um, you would probably, there'd be a variation, but for the most part, I'm assuming there would be a general consensus of this is who you are. Does this make sense? Now, that's not always the case. I definitely don't want to speak in absolutes this morning, but I think we actually have... Um, we do that in, in, with famous people as well. If I were to name some names, whether it was political or in, for entertainment, uh, famous people or whatever, if I were to say those names, you would say, oh yeah, that is this. For instance, I'll give this example. If I were to say Gandhi, I would imagine without, with slight variation, most of you would go, oh, he was, and you would be able to describe who he was. Does this make sense? So <clears throat> you have somewhat of an identity Now, what you use it for or not is really interesting, and I think that what God is saying to us is if you haven't already, if you give me you, I'm not necessarily, in most cases, going to do a major uh, 
uh, overhaul, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask you to do what you do for me. And so what he does with Abram, he goes from exalted father to father of many nations, from princess to my princess, or vice versa, depending on how you read the Hebrew. But he's essentially saying, I'm going to make some changes. Let me give another example. When Jacob was born, he was called, Jacob's name, Jacob's name means deceiver or supplanter, literally the one who grabs the heel as they were wrestling in the, in the womb, right? Andrea, aren't you glad you didn't have that going on? Or maybe you did. <laughs> did you? It was like, whoop, bam, you know, type of thing. Yeah. All right, we'll talk about that later. Hudson, be nice to your sister. But when Esau came out, what happened? If you read the scripture, Jacob had his hand on his heel. Isn't that right? So he was a wrestler. What does Jesus do later in his life? He wrestles with him. And he says, guess what, Jacob? You've wrestled with God and prevailed. Why? Because Jacob, this is how Jacob wrestled. He says, I'm not letting go of you unless you bless me. And Jesus goes, okay, touches his thigh, <laughs> throws it out of whack. But he essentially says, you've wrestled with me and you won. Why? Because now, Jacob, you've actually given me your life and now you'll wrestle for me. And I'm going to call you Israel now. Isn't that awesome? When you go, well, let me give you another. Let me, let me show you some scripture. This, I, this is fun. I, 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 go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we'll look at verse... Three. This is the fourth book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 4. Excuse me, 8. Sorry. Acts, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. I want, you to, I want to show how awesome God is and how patient he is. Look at verse uh, 3. It says, As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. This was the worst, one of the worst men towards Christians early on. He literally would knock on doors, go from house to house. Any Christians in here? He would take them to prison, was, was trying to kill Christians. Now, as, and I'm just going to throw this out. If we were the underground church at this time, we would be praying things probably in a sweet way, but something to the effect of, oh, Lord, kill Saul. Help him develop some sort of quick disease and die quickly. <laughs> right? Strike him with anything. But I want you to get this. Here's what God's going. You know, <laughs> if he would just give his life to me, I could use that type of tenacity. You read the story, and then he gets blind, right? And you're like, yes, he's blind. No more attacking the Christians. But this isn't what happens at all. Jesus comes up to him and on the road to Damascus and goes, hey, um, I know you think you're doing the right thing, but you're actually, you're persecuting me. It's, I'm Jesus. You're the one, you're, this isn't good. And I'd like to actually have you be on my team. Go to Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Watch what happens to Saul, which, by the way, does he get a name change? Yeah, he's going by Paul now. Big difference. <laughs> Acts 20, verse 20. What does he say he does? How he kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. He just starts doing the same thing he was doing, but he's on God's teams now. Can you imagine if you were one of those first doors that Saul slash new Paul knocked on? You knock on the door, they open it, they go, oh no, they take off. It's like, wait, 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 I flipped. <laughs> I don't want to hit you with that sword, I have a new sword. And he uses Paul to write essentially the New Testament. And this is what God would have you to do. God actually wants to use you for his glory. And some of the things that maybe your whole life you've been told in an annoying fashion that you shouldn't do anymore, maybe God's like, well, if you gave that talent over to me, I could make it a really good thing. 
I think of famous people like, if you listen to Mark Lowry, the comedian who uh, traveled with the uh, Bill Gaither. Can you imagine how, if there's any teachers in the room, can you imagine that kid in the classroom? That'd be terrible. But given to the Lord, he did amazing things. I'm going to suggest to you that maybe not here at Paw Paw, but in maybe even Adventists need name changing. It's possible that entire churches who think like Saul, they're doing great work for the Lord, are actually doing great damage. And if you would give yourself completely to him, he might not change everything you do. He might just shift the, fo- the focus. Now, I learned this recently because of an initiative we started in the youth department called Fieldwork. Now, Fieldwork is a very simple concept. (coughs) We basically go into the community, we knock on people's doors that we don't even know, and we ask them if they need any help around their house. So you just go up, hey, how you doing, Ken? I'm Chad. I'm here to help you. You need any help? Sure do. Okay, come on in. Now, this is what's really intriguing about the concept, is most people don't believe I'm for real, or whoever goes. They're like, wait a minute. You want to just help me? What's your angle? I don't have an angle. How much is it going to cost me? Nothing. Yeah, right. I remember I knocked, I started out, we did this, our first one in Detroit. We knocked on a door. And the guy's like, who are you? <laughs> now, I got a, I don't know how to say it. I was, uh, I don't know how to say this. So I'm, I'm, I'm around eight mile. I have flannel on and jeans. And I look like, I don't know how else to say We're on video. I look like a country person. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> I look pretty country. I'm like, hey. And he's like, you know, what are you doing here? And I go, uh, well, I'm here to help you in your home. Uh, and I, I said, is, is, I'm going to change the name, um, is Pam here? And uh, he's like, uh, no, Pam's not here, that's my mom. And I go, oh, well, Pam told me she needed some help in her house. He goes, it's my house. I said, okay. He goes, who are you? I said, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and we have this thing called field work, and we help people's homes. We race, and I, and, and I, I told him, I said, we have a budget for about $500. We're going to help fix anything you need in your home up to that amount. He looked at me, and he said... You can't, he proceeded to tell me what I couldn't do with $500. And I said, well, why don't you let me in your house and we'll find out. And he goes, okay, come on in. (laughs) So I come into his house and he started telling me all these things that needed to be done and how much this plumber was going to charge and how much this person was going to charge. And I was just like, yeah, I think we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. And uh, when we got done, he goes, wait a minute, you're going to do all that for $500? I go, yeah, I'm pretty sure we can do that. And he said to me, who are you again? (laughs) Now, follow me on this. This is when I realized that there was some name changing going on. Because, first of all, he had never heard of what a Seventh-day Adventist was. But when I left, here's how he defined Seventh-day Adventists. Some people I don't even know are going to come into my house and help me for free. No strings attached. That's probably a good thing. Does this make sense? So here's what I've I've come to this conclusion. There's been a lot of talk about how young people specifically um, are, have seen no value in church anymore. And I'm going to suggest to you a couple of things. They don't see value in certain types of churches. They see no value in going to a place, dressing up to go to a place, to act differently than they normally act, to be greeted by people who greet them differently than any other day of the week, to have food that they may or may not have, and then go home and take a nap. To them, that is not why Jesus died on the cross. But could it be that that's not what church was set up to be. I've heard of your Jesus and Jeans initiative. Awesome. Like, I'm super excited. If I would have known, I wore jeans. 
because I love jeans. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I mean, when you're doing that, let me know. I'd love to come down. Young people want, and I, think, I don't think this is young people, any old people who want to actually advance the kingdom of heaven in their community. This isn't an age-specific thing. And so here's what I found is what we have done with young people is we've raised them to be consumers. Their entire life from, from Hudson and, and Holly's age, everything they do, we just think is fantastic. We put it on our fridges, and we encourage, and we encourage, and we do everything for our young people, and we try to give them everything that's perfect until they get to an age where usually, and, they, and if, if they go to Adventist colleges, they have the best speakers and the best music and everything, and then they come back to whatever their local church, and then we go, okay, stop consuming now and contribute. And people go, I don't want to. You're not meeting my needs. I'm going to leave. But what if we decided to train our young people instead of being only consumers to actually to pick up their cross and follow Christ and contribute and to actually be active and to help other people because the high that I get from helping people is much greater than when I just simply consume. And here's what I'm finding. Young people who are active in church that actually are talking to people who aren't Adventists, no offense, and who are engaged in this great controversy find value in church and want to be a part of church because this is an army that is moving Amen. instead of a building that is deteriorating. Name changes. God is calling us to do that. And I truly, truly believe that culture is shifting. And young people are seeing this. They want to do this. And old people are working together. This, this field work initiative, that we call it the $100 challenge. Old and young are working together. It's intergenerational ministry, and it's powerful. We have one actually coming up in the end of March, uh, March 29th, 28th and 29th in Benton Harbor, not too far away if you're interested. Unashamedly, I'm promoting it, fieldwork.love. Go to the website. It's fantastic. But let's actually go and make connections. We're partnering with local churches so that after we help them, no strings attached, we're actually starting friendships from this. And people are getting to know one another. And they're, they're actually trying to add value to each other's lives instead of trying to debate theologically who's right and who's, who's wrong. We're actually trying to make a difference. Changing names, changing lines, changing perceptions. You know, um, one day soon, Jesus is going to come. It's unacceptable to me for my family not to be in the kingdom. It's unacceptable. I got a five-year-old. I don't know if I want to go without her. I know that sounds crazy. I know that I'll probably get yelled at later for that. But if you're a father and you're a mother, you get what I'm saying right now. She's got to go. She's got to choose Christ. And here's what I found. Me just telling her what to do and when to do it and forcing her will never work. But living that faith, being that change, I think it's going to work. I want my daughter... to choose God's way because she's God's girl, not because I'm forcing her to. So we must, we must change the way we're doing things if they're not in accordance with God's will. So I've, I've come and said, I dedicate my life to be your kid. 
which has really been fun lately because when I talk to people that knew me when I was younger, matter of fact, this last week I was talking to a high school friend of mine, hadn't talked to since high school. He goes, I can't even believe you're alive, <laughs> let alone the youth director for the Michigan Conference. And then he went off on how much he loved our conference. I said, let me just tell you this. God is good. God is good. I love this state. I love my conference. I love my church. We're changing the name. If that's what you think we are, you're wrong. That's not who we are. And let me explain to you why. Brothers and sisters, I believe that that is a message for this time. And my prayer is that here in Paw Paw, that would be your desire as well. Amen? How many would just like to say, I, I want to give him my life. He can do whatever he wants with it. I want to change my name from Mark to Marky. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes. But I want it to be known that he's in charge. You know, when you name a baby, that means you're in charge of the baby. And that's why when Jesus would come up to me and go, oh, Simon, huh? No, Peter. He would go up to people and go, no, why? Because I'm in charge of your life now. You're giving me room to take over all your heart. I'm in charge. I'm giving you a new name. And I can't wait to see Jesus face to face and go, Chad, it's time for a change. Amen. What you got for me? And he gives me that name in a language I've never heard before. And he says, by God's grace and his grace alone, well done, a good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's, let's pray. Lord, I pray that everyone here would give you their lives. That as a church, they would be on the move, defeating hell here in Papa. Defeating them, maybe not with a sword or an Uzi, but with bread, hammer, nails, financial counseling, whatever the needs are of the community, winning them by touching lives, proclaiming Jesus with their lips, yes, but screaming loudly with their actions who you are and your plan for them. Lord, expand this church, my prayer, my desire. And Lord, just got to say it, may the youth lead the way. May this be something that the youth go, yeah, I'm in, all in. My prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand as we sing the closing hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. That's hymn number 229.